Good morning. It's good to be with all of you on this 14th Sunday after Pentecost uh, together in God's house on this day. A couple of announcements before we uh, get started with worship. Uh, we are <clears throat> bringing back the choir, uh, so getting that started up again. So if you have any interest in singing in our church choir, uh, please uh, shoot uh, Thomas Winterstein an email. Uh, he'd love to have you uh, join us for the choir. So that will be starting up soon. Also, as a reminder, uh, when we collect our offering to, when you sign the attendance cards, to place the attendance card in the offering plate. Uh, that will be uh, very helpful for us. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and begin with our invocation. I invite you to please stand. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Of 
Jane is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and mighty in our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, his love breaks the chains. And every knee will bow.
thank you for your great love. We thank you that you never give up on us, that no matter how far we run from you, no matter what dark corner we find ourselves in, you're always pursuing us with your love. You never fail. You never leave any of your children behind. We're thankful for that, Father, because we know that left on our own, we wander far and wide from the goodness of your will and your ways. Our brokenness leaves us lost in the darkness of a sinful world. We need the light of your love to break through, to lead us out of our sin, to wash away the dirt that we find our lives covered in. And so, Father, this morning, as we come before you, we each come to you in the silence of our own hearts and we lay bare all those things all those things that have separated us from you all the walls we put up between you and us between our neighbors and ourselves we lay them before you now Our God is great, whose compassion never fails, and who is abounding in steadfast love. We need look no further than our very breath that we breathe to know that our God is caring and providing for us. That provision includes grace for all the messiness and brokenness in our lives. Through the work of our Messiah Jesus, there is grace upon grace for each and every one of us. So today, as we are bidden by our Heavenly Father to turn back to Him, I, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. No. 
all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great Our Old Testament reading for today is from Deuteronomy chapter 4. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the just decrees that I am teaching you, and do them that you may live, and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us, whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes statutes and just decrees so, so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading is from Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Gospel reading is from Mark chapter 7. Jesus called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. 
And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters, enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things come from within. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the title of the sermon is, is Getting Down to the Heart of the Matter. Getting down to the heart of the matter. It's a continuation, really, I, ho I hope this is the idea, week in and week out, that we continue this conversation. It's one that God starts and God ultimately has the last word, but you and I are, are having that conversation together. Last week, uh, Pastor Luke preached on Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 13. The title of the sermon, if I remember correctly, is Keeping the Main Thing the Main Thing. But it had to do with what is the place, is there any, of man-made traditions? The question that was posed to Jesus by the Pharisees was one about Jesus' disciples. And the Pharisees, they didn't like what Jesus' disciples were doing. And here's an image that might prompt your memory if you've forgotten. The question was, Jesus, why do your disciples eat with hands that are unwashed? That is defiled and rather than even indulge the question Jesus answers it was something from the prophet Isaiah it was something to call into question the questioners the Pharisees who were asking Jesus about being concerned about hands that were impure or unclean Jesus quoted Isaiah chapter 29 verse 13 and it had to do with the, the, the whole being, being committed to God and, and loving God with heart, soul, and mind, uh, and spirit. In, in Isaiah, though, he said to the people of God, and it was meant to tear down, he said, these people honors me with their lips. Oh, but their hearts, the core of who they are, are walled off. They're far from me. Thomas touched on this in the prayer when we confessed our sins, that our, our temptation is to wall our hearts off from God. Well, you can have my hands, but, but my hearts, well, that's my heart. I've only got one heart. That's for me. But Jesus was saying to not only the Pharisees, but still says to you and me, if we keep the main thing the main thing, if we love God rightly, we'll love other people and other things rightly. The question that I wonder about, that Jesus was posing to the Pharisees, was, well, why are your hearts far from God? The rational thing, and the thing that these, these Jewish people would know if they know the, the law of God, his statutes, and his will for their life, we know that God says that my will for you is to live, not to die. And so choose the way of life, and yet, and yet, they were loving other things more than God. And so the traditions take on the place of prominence in the main thing. Well, that was lost. So Jesus, though, is not concerned so much about hands, but he is concerned about hearts, and that's where we pick up today. Jesus calls the people to him, so he's had this this interaction with the pharisees and now he says jesus does never waste words or opportunities he says you know what Let, let's have everybody gather around and, and and listen to this so he calls the people to him again and he says to them hear me all of you and understand hear O israel listen people of god and understand in isaiah chapter 5 there's a reality that, that God announces. He says, there, there will be people that hear and they don't understand anything. There are people who have eyesight, but they can't perceive anything. 
But, but for those who are called by faith, who hear God's word, they, they hear it and they understand it and they see and they perceive, they understand reality. And so Jesus wants the people to hear him and to understand. But here's the thing about Jesus. He, he is not nice. He's not nice. Earlier this week, I think it was this week, I don't know when it was, because Thomas's office is, is Thomas Corner, right outside of my office, so I never miss an opportunity to talk about whatever's on my mind. Uh, and I said, Thomas, do you know the origin of the word nice? And then pulled up his phone and looked at the etymology. I believe it's, it's from like the 13th century or the 1300s. A French word originally, nice, the original meaning of nice, it means foolish. It means ignorant. It means senseless. You know who's nice? Toddlers are nice. They're foolish. They don't know things. They don't have a lot of sense. So I, I think if we ever say of Jesus, hey, you're really nice. No, Jesus is not a nice guy. The temptation to think in the church, though, we are just nice people. Always nice. Very pleasant today. Nice to see you. How are you? Oh, I'm good. Nice. It's all good. No, but really. So Jesus wants to get down to the heart of the matter. He isn't nice. He is not afraid. He is not afraid to challenge. He is not afraid to confront. He's not afraid to get to the heart of the matter. He's not concerned about, well, you'd hate to rock the boat. Don't mess with uh, upsetting the status quo today. That is at least of his concerns. He says, you know, you're worried about hands. I'm worried about your heart. So Jesus now, he, he, he goes deeper. He says, there is, look, just understand this, there is nothing, not anything in all of creation that is outside of a person that by going into him can defile him, can desecrate him or her, can profane him or her, can take from sacred and pure to impure and unholy there is nothing the pharisees ask jesus initially a question about how to eat and jesus answers with well here's what makes a person unclean not even going to indulge the question he does this again and again he's not nice so this this hangs out there jesus makes this statement And when he had entered the house, and he left the people, his disciples have had some time to think about this. They come up to Jesus, and, and they, they ask him a question. Now, sometimes when Jesus teaches with a parable, he will say after the fact, I'm going to explain to you now what this means, just so there's no question. Other times he doesn't, but this is unique because now the disciples come to Jesus, and they ask him, what were you talking about back there? It's this intimate moment with Jesus and his disciples. And Jesus, notice what he says to them. He says, then are you also without understanding? You, you, you have been with me from the moment that I called you to leave your nets and they dropped everything and followed him. When, when Matthew left his ledger, when he was collecting the taxes, he leaves everything and follows him. They have been with him when he cast out demons, when he calms the storms, when he walks on the water, when he feeds 5,000 people plus with five loaves of bread and two fish when he raises the dead and they still, he says, so where have you been? You, you haven't been listening? You haven't been watching? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him? It's a reality check. Do you not see what's happening here? And then he gets a little bit of an anatomy lesson. Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. And thus he declared all foods clean. And that would be a whole other sermon, but that comes in the book of Acts and, and where Peter then uh, has this dream and, and God tells him to take and eat. It's Peter and Cornelius, but, but the, it's not about the foods that you eat or don't eat that will make you unclean. 
but it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. So then Jesus says, it's what comes out of a person. What comes out of a person is what defiles him. He's not talking about bathroom stuff here. Not talking about sneezing and all your virus that you're giving to me and everyone around you. Not talking about puking or vomiting. Vomit, that's a fun word. Not talking about any of that. See, he's talking, he's talking about the, the heart. Now, Jesus can see right into people's hearts. I can't, you can't. But what we can judge, what we can see are people's actions. Are their actions consistent with what they say? Are our actions consistent with what we say? So if I start hanging uh, an IU banner in front of my house, you might begin to question me, right? Because you, you've always said, Pastor Troy, you're a huge Purdue fan. Why all of a sudden you're flying the IU flag? And I would say, well, I'm, I guess I'm nice now. I'm <laughs> foolish and ignorant and senseless. That worked out pretty well. Remember that. Write that down, Pastor Luke. So uh, only nice people root for IU. Uh, but you'd say, hey, that, well, your, your actions are not consistent with what you say. Or if, if you say, you know, I'm, I'm really into fitness now and nutrition. And you say, well, you know, it looks like, as far as I can tell, you haven't worked out for two years. And you, you have no discernment in what you eat. But hey, whatever you say. Right? So we, we say, I can't judge your heart, but I can judge your behaviors. It doesn't seem to line up. But Jesus can see right into our hearts. And so Jesus then begins to list off, and Pastor Luke has already read it, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, he doesn't stop there, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. The things that come out of the heart of the man are, and the woman are not good things. They're not things that build up or lead to life or, or strengthen relationships. They tear apart. See, God gives us his law, his commands, his will for us when we think about God's law is that we live. It has to do with relationships. We keep the main thing, the main thing, the first three commandments, the first table of the law has to do with our relationship with God. Keep the main thing, the main thing. You shall have no other gods. Martin Luther would say it this way. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God after everything else doesn't work. True or false? Well, okay, a couple people yeah, are, are tracking here. Some people taking a nap. It is darker in here today. Uh, so I told the ushers I'd be watching. Brent Locke, okay, you're still awake. Good, eye contact. Uh, so the first table of law has to do with our relationship with God. Keep the main thing the main thing. If we, if we keep the main thing the main thing, then all the other things... Commandments 4 through 10, which have to do with our relationships with other people, with our neighbor. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. That's the greatest commandment. The second commandment flows right from it. Love your neighbor as yourself. God's will is that we live. He gives us these statutes, not so we can build him up, because he gets low confidence, so he can build us up. So that his creation works as he intended it all along. And so when Jesus lays this out and he starts listing off these, these things that tear us apart. Amen, brother. That's right. These things that tear us apart. These evil thoughts. Sexual immorality. Well, what commandment? Sexual immorality. You know the commandment? You got a one in ten chance at an even number. What commandment? Sexual immorality. You know it? I just put you on the hot seat. Doug, you're going to phone a friend? Sixth commandment, you agree? Okay, ding, ding, sixth commandment, yeah. So Jesus starts listing off the commandments. The sixth commandment, sexual immorality, theft. What commandment is that? Pastor Luke, you've been here. Seven, he knows this. Pastor Luke, incidentally, youth confirmation starting up a couple weeks. Uh, seventh commandment, theft. Murder, the fifth commandment. Adultery, back to the sixth commandment. Coveting, eight, oh no, coveting, nine and ten as we number them. We're not reformed. Uh, wickedness, deceit. 
Right? You, could, you could put deceit under the second commandment. You could put deceit under really the eighth commandment. But sensuality, envy, slander, eighth commandment again, pride, really that first commandment applies to all of them. Foolishness, first commandment again. These things are contrary to God's will for our lives. See, sin is something that is not, well, it's always has to do with relationships, but sin really, and here's where you can see, I know how to use the language of the day, sin is anti-relational. I know in this day and age when you want to make a point, you call something anti-something. So you are anti-Purdue. I am anti-Cornhuskers, and so apparently is Illinois, Pastor Luke. So uh, sin is anti-relational. Sin comes and it, it, it destroys a connection to God and other people. And so what comes out of lust and anger, you put them together, you get like a bloodlust. All these things are anti-relational. And they're not things that come from the outside, they're things that come from within. And they defile a person. See, see, love itself doesn't look like any of these things. Love doesn't look like sexual immorality. It doesn't look like theft. It doesn't say, you know, I love you so much, I think I'm going to take your life now. That is not what love looks like. As far as I know, love is, is patient. Love is kind. Love is not quick to anger, but slow to anger. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love looks exactly like Jesus, who is the spitting image of his father. Love looks like kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. That's what love looks like, the fruits of the Spirit. But, but Jesus says all these evil things come from within, and they uh, defile a person. So when it comes to sin, it is initially, it starts with a matter of the heart, and a heart that is cut off from God. And if we were a 1980s or 90s rapper, you would say it this way. You better check yourself. Before you, what, Miss McCormick? Wreck yourself. That sounds like something a fourth grade teacher would say to her classroom. If I know Miss McCormick, I bet Drew Countryman would say, Yeah, I know Miss McCormick says, Drew, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Because there is a personal responsibility, right, Bowen boy? Bowen's fourth grader, too. Yeah, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Because Miss McCormick loves her students and she speaks the truth. She's not nice either. That's not a compliment. My way. So, yeah, I mean, it is a compliment to not be nice. So it is, it is a matter of the heart, and, and these things come from within, and they defile a person. It, it's, it's not an issue of the hands. It's, it's what animates the hands. It's the core of who and what a person is. All these evil things, they come from within, and they defile a person. It is about, you see, the thing is, and this is what I've had to learn over time, and I'm still learning it, I can't control the things around me. I mean, I can make an influence on them, but there is one person that I can control, and that's me. I, I can control how I choose to react and respond to things. Now, I, I do it with varying degrees of success. I hopefully, I'm getting better. But here's my mom sitting here and could tell you, and now my wife and my kids. But what I can't, I can't control when things get spilled, but I can't control how much I yell at people. I can't control when the dog pukes, but I can't control whether I shake him violently or not, which Andrea did, was not impressed with. See, it, 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 it is about responsibility, and, and it starts with, hey, check yourself, Troy, before you wreck yourself. G.K. Chesterton said it this way, at least it's attributed to, to him, attributed to him maybe during World War II, the Times, I believe, of London sent out to different writers and thinkers this question, what is wrong with the world? And they sent varying responses back, and G.K. Chesterton's is my favorite. It was very simple. Dear sir, Chesterton says, what is wrong with the world? I am. He's getting down to the heart of the matter, which is what we do when we come into this place and we confess our sins. We don't stand here, even though maybe it's tempting. Uh, God, I would like to confess to you all the sins of the people that I live with. 
I'd like to confess to you all the sins of the people that I work with. I don't really have a lot to say for me, but boy, you ought to check them out. No, we confess our sin because the one thing I can control, or maybe I'm confessing what I didn't control, or maybe I'm confessing what I did leave out because ultimately the issue is not with other people. My issue and yours is ultimately with God. Because when you stand before the throne of judgment, he's not judging you based on other people's sin. He's judging you based on your sin and your heart. And there is nothing that darkens a man or woman's heart like a conscience that is unclean or impure. But you know where you go to get a new heart? To God. But in that vein, I don't want to forget before I get to this, another way of looking at this, if you like Pogo the possum, not a porcupine. I wasn't as familiar with this. Uh, Thomas was, but uh, what is wrong with the world? Or you say, well, we have met the enemy, and he is us. And that's if you're concerned about environmentalism and campsites. Don't leave your litter on the campsite. That also is attributed to a 19th century naval officer from the Battle of Lake Erie. We have met the enemy, and he is us. I don't know anything more about it, but it starts with us. The issue is a heart issue. And the only way to get a new heart, a heart that is in line with God, that is not only calibrated but cleansed rightly, is to go to God. And God's desire is to give you and me a new heart. We hear this in the Old Testament. It is the prophet Ezekiel who goes to the people of God and speaks on God's behalf. And God promises, I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh even though everybody is looking, apparently, for a heart of gold. I'm getting old. But God is going to remove your heart of stone. Because an ossified, calcified heart is a dead heart. But he's going to give us a heart that actually beats and pumps blood and life. And I will give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes because my will is that they walk and follow me. I am the Lord of life because a dead person can't walk anywhere. But a living person can hear and see and has life and freedom. And they'll keep my rules and obey them because it's just the thing that's best for them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. I am his, and he is mine. King David understood this when he stood, or probably knelt, maybe face first on the ground before God, and he cries out, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me with a, a willing spirit, not a spirit that is merely nice or, or, or a, a contrary spirit or a spirit that goes the other way or wants to fight with you, God, because you'll lose every fight with God. I mean, you can fight with God all you want, but we'll lose. But a spirit that is willing, that loves you and in turn loves my neighbor. See, the issue, it starts, what's wrong with the world? Well, it's me. If you're going to blame anybody, blame yourself first. Not a popular answer. You're a, victim of, you're a victim of your own circumstance. Or the issue also, well, it is a spiritual issue. We heard the, the lesson from Ephesians chapter 6. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Our wrestle, our battle is, well, there is a spiritual battle and it's against Satan because the old Adam, the old Eve, the sinful nature is happy to go along and collude with Satan in things that don't build up but only destroy. I don't think the answer with Flip Wilson of the devil made me do it is a very satisfying answer. You can give it, but I'd say it's too simple. But there is a spiritual battle out there. But I will tell you, when we're thinking about sin and the impacts of sin, I think there are only two answers. The first one is what's wrong with the world, and we've confessed it today, it's me. And you could say, but Satan, uh, could we, Shannon, could you take me back to wherever slide I was on that was a picture, because now I'm 
I do want to confess the creed, but not yet. For some reason, it is not there. Uh, go back one more. The, the, you're letting the, the keep go back one more. Well, that's fine. Just leave it. No, that's good. Okay, we'll go back to this next one. Keep, go, we'll go one more. I'll do, okay, hold it right there. Nothing else. Okay, good. I think this, this painting by one of my favorite artists, uh, Edward Riowas, um, this is from the book, uh, Dear Christians, One and All Rejoice, where he illustrates hymn verses here. And this verse, I think, shows both the, the tension of, well, it starts with me, and sin is, about, is, is anti-relational, and sin, it, it cuts us off, first of all, from God, but also from one another. And there you see Adam and Eve who are standing there, and, and God's will for, for them was to live, but they decide to take matters into their own hands. They collude with Satan, the tempter. They are now entangled and enmeshed in sin. They can't bear the sight of themselves. They can't bear the sight of one another. They can't find God because, well, they don't deserve him anyway, and now they are not alive but dead. They are a victim of their own circumstance. But at the same time, we see that there is Jesus who hangs on the cross for the sins that they have committed, but it is by Jesus' death that he has destroyed death itself. And there is that more than a serpent, but looks like a dragon, a slithering dragon, who is crushed. See, ultimately, our problem is with God. And the only solution, the main thing, is Jesus, who is in the center of all things. But the temptation always is to blame, right? That's what Adam and Eve did. Adam, what did you do? Well, God, I'm glad you asked. Uh, it's Eve's fault. If you had never given me this woman, I mean, I thought she was a blessing, actually a curse. And then Eve, what did you do? Well, um, I did, I, it wasn't my fault. This, the serpent, you put this serpent here. You put this tree here, a good looking tree. Not my fault. And so the blame game happens, and ultimately it's God who has mercy, who gives life. But the blame game is something that, that it keeps coming up because the, the temptation is to, to say, well, the enemy is always someone or something. Who do we blame for what's wrong with the world? Well, I know what to do on August 29th, 2021. I think I follow the science. You know who I blame? Everyone who is unvaccinated. Well, actually, no, if you follow the science, I think I would blame everyone who is vaccinated because now they're carrying even more viral load and they don't even know it. And now they're killing everyone else. Well, I don't know. You know who I would blame? People who, people who don't wear masks. Well, I would blame people who do wear masks. You know who I would blame? I would blame all of the Democrats. No, actually, it's not the Democrats. They're all very good, very, very loving people. It's all the Republicans don't care a, a whit about anybody. No, I would actually blame all the liberals. No, I would actually blame all the conservatives. You know who I would blame? The problem is all of these woke people. No, actually, you know what the opposite of woke is? I know it's based or base. They're the problem. You know who I would blame? I would blame the Jews. No, actually, it's the Christians' fault. Well, you know, I would actually blame the Muslims. No, I would actually blame the atheists. On and on it goes. But, you know, it hits even closer to home. You know who I would blame as we're thinking about things here at St. John? I would blame Pastor Luke. And then he would say, I would blame Pastor Troy. No, no you know what? I would blame all those fuddy duddies in the traditional service. Nope, you're actually wrong about that. I would blame all those people that go to the new song service and are all their newfangled songs. You know what, though? But we have a school here. I would blame all those school families. They're not pulling their weight. You know what, though? I would blame those church families don't have anything to do with the school. It's their fault. I would blame the office. I would blame the teachers. On and on and on it goes. Oh, wretched men and women that we are, who will deliver us from this body of death? And the answer is Jesus. Amen. Jesus. You know where the blame goes? Into Jesus. He hangs there on the cross. The sinless one. The blameless one. For you and me. He takes all of the 
the things that we're so tempted to justify for any and every reason, he takes it into himself. And he also takes all of your neighbor's sin into himself. It is by his death that he has destroyed death, but he is not dead. He is very much alive. He is risen. And in him, we have life. We are free. We have forgiveness. We have the truth. If only we could live like we believed it. If only I could live like I believed it. The last part of this, though, is, is something that, that Pastor Luke and, and Thomas and I talked about this week is, well, okay, so, so we could play the blame game, but the reality is Jesus has died for everyone, even the people I'm most tempted to blame. But also, so the greatest commandment is to love God, and the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. But the, the temptation is to wait until tomorrow to love your neighbor. And so I'll say it this way, and I think this is true. You can only love your neighbor today. See, I, I like to procrastinate. Anything that could be done today would probably even be better to do, do tomorrow. And a lot of times, I will lie to myself and justify, you know what, it would be good to love my neighbor, and I'll start doing that tomorrow. But for today, I'm going to hold on to my grudges. And then you know what happens when tomorrow comes? I say, you know what would be a really good idea? To forgive my neighbor, to love my neighbor. And I will do that tomorrow. It is so easy, at least if you're like me, to lie to myself and justify waiting until tomorrow to love my neighbor. And the blame game, it just keeps going and going and going. But you and I are in the right place, the best place to be on a Sunday morning or soon it'll be afternoon. Where the main thing is still the main thing, it's all about Jesus. The one who took your sin and your neighbor's sin to the cross, the one who was raised on the third day and who is alive, and in him you and I are free to love God and love your neighbor, not tomorrow, but today. Today. See, there is freedom that comes in personal responsibility that says, yeah, God, you know, if I'm honest, what's wrong with the world is me. And he says, I'm so glad you said that. You are forgiven. Look to Jesus. You are free. And now don't use that freedom just to sit on the couch and never do anything again, but use that freedom to love your neighbor, to courageously love your neighbor. I don't know all your neighbors, but you do. And so does God. And they are people for whom Christ died, just like you. So live in that freedom in love and mercy that Jesus has first shown to us. Amen. And now may the peace that passes understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds in, in Jesus our Lord and Savior. Amen. We continue now. Is it the creed now? Let's stand and confess the creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, 
Drink of this, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated. in stories and words they think you're alive but I've heard tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleasing that I'm never alone you're a good to you are, to you are, to you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers. You are perfect in all. 
can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love
true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you both in body and soul today and to life everlasting depart in his joy and peace amen please rise for prayer we give thanks to you almighty God that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift and we implore you that you would of, that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another Lord God, we lift up to you the prayers for the gift of the Holy Spirit at work in, in the word of truth, that by his discretion we would not stray from the way of God's commandments, nor forget the wonderful blessings he has given to us. We pray for protection against everything that defiles in heart and soul, and to keep us from all evil, and to create a pure heart and re renew a right spirit within us. We pray for all those in need of health, healing, and mercy. We especially pray for Rip Coons as he's been hospitalized, for Pam and Shirley as they recover from surgery. For all those being treated from cancer and for all who have requested our prayers, especially this day, Lisa Steele, the daughter-in-law of Bill and Nancy Steele. We pray for all those impacted by disaster and turmoil, especially those suffering in Haiti and Afghanistan, and for all those who serve in our armed forces. We pray for hearts purified by God's cleansing word and aid to lead godly lives before him and all these things. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. This time we gather our tithes and offerings. We also ask you to fill out the attendance cards and place them into the offering plate.
please rise for the blessing and our closing song. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Have a great week.